Hello, I'm Professor Akshar at Glendale Community College. This is Physics 103, Lecture 41. In this lecture, we'll discuss the ideal gas. This topic is covered in Chapter 19 of our textbook by Surway and Jouet. In this lecture, we want to discuss the ideal gas. The ideal gas really is a model for the realistic, interesting gases that we want to discuss in this class. The ideal gas model was really the first and simplest model that successfully predicted the behavior of matter. A little more precisely, an ideal gas is a collection of n identical weakly interacting particles confined to volume V with total energy E. So the ideal gas is really described by three parameters, the number of particles, the volume in which those particles live, and the total energy of those particles. The particles must be identical, meaning that they must have the same mass, charge, and other properties. And most importantly, the particles must be weakly interacting. This is what makes them a gas and not a liquid or a solid. A little more precisely, weakly interacting means that there are no long range forces such as gravity or electric forces. These are the forces that are normally responsible for atoms bonding together and forming rigid, solid configurations. Here, these weakly interacting particles can interact with each other only through contact forces. What that means is that two particles may influence each other through direct contact, in other words, through a collision, but once the two particles are separated, there are no long-range forces between them, so they can no longer influence each other or exert forces on one another once they are separated even by the smallest distances. Otherwise, we assume that these particles obey all the laws of classical mechanics. So all the physics, uh, physics that you learned in your mechanics course, such as Newton's laws of motion, conservation of energy, conservation of momentum, they all still apply to these individual particles. If you want to have a picture in mind of what an ideal gas looks like, you can essentially imagine a large collection of ping pong balls zipping around inside the box. These ping pong balls may collide with the walls of the container and occasionally they may collide with each other and as they do there is conservation of momentum and we can apply all the physics that we have learned in our mechanics course to individual collisions between these particles. Our goal for the rest of this lecture is to understand the properties of this ideal gas and in the long run we'd like to understand what happens to the gas when we, for example, add energy to it or change the size of the box. It took more than 100 years of experimentation for physicists to fully understand the ideal gas. One of the first people to investigate properties of the ideal gas was Robert Boyle. To understand Boyle's experiments and the experiments of many subsequent physicists, Consider a cylinder filled with a fixed quantity of ideal gas. So what we have here is a cylindrical container, and we've filled it with some ideal gas to height h. Usually the inert elements from the periodic table make good ideal gases. For example, helium or neon gas at room temperature are good examples of an ideal gas. So we have filled the cylindrical container with some ideal gas, and then we have capped it with a piston. The piston is essentially a disc with cross-sectional area A, and it prevents the gas from escaping the cylindrical container. The piston is free to move up and down, but it does seal the gas inside. The gas inside has some pressure, and therefore it exerts an upward force on the piston. To keep the piston in place, we'll place some mass or some weight on top of the piston to hold it down. A little more precisely, we can say that once a mass has been placed on top of the piston, a downward force that is equal to the weight of the mass is now being applied. Weight, of course, is mass times gravitational acceleration. Recall from our lecture on pressure that pressure is equal to force divided by area. Since the gas inside has a certain pressure, as the molecules of the gas collide with the piston, they push up on the piston. 
So there is an upward force on the piston, which we'll call force of the gas, and that force is equal to pressure of the gas times the area of the piston. By choosing the mass suitably, we can achieve equilibrium between these two forces. So by correctly choosing the right value of M, we could have a situation where these two forces balance each other out. Also suppose that our cylinder is equipped with a thermometer that allows us to easily measure the temperature of the gas inside. And we also have a source of energy like a Bunsen burner that allows us to heat up the gas or even cool it down. So we may add or subtract energy to the gas that's inside. Now notice that the volume of the gas can be expressed in terms of the height of the gas. A little more precisely, we can say that the volume of the gas is equal to the cross-sectional area of the piston times the height of the cylinder, at least the portion of the cylinder that is filled with gas. Also note that we can express the pressure of the gas in terms of mass. So by measuring this mass, we can figure out what the pressure of the gas inside is. After all, when the piston is in equilibrium, Pa must be equal to Mg. By solving that equation, we find that the pressure of the gas must be equal to the weight of the mass divided by area of the piston. Also note that because we are equipped with a thermometer, we can measure the temperature of the gas easily. Robert Boyle was interested in investigating this specific question here. Suppose temperature is kept constant. If mass is increased, what happens to height? So imagine that we stack additional weights on top of the piston. So imagine that we increase the mass. We want to know what happens to the height of the gas. It probably doesn't seem too surprising that as we increase the mass, the height decreases. After all, placing more masses on top of the piston amounts to pushing the piston downwards and that, of course, reduces the height of the gas inside. As we do this, we are effectively increasing the pressure and decreasing the volume. Note that uh, mass and pressure are related, so as we increase the mass, that's the same thing as increasing the pressure. Also, volume and height are related, so when we decrease the height, we're basically decreasing the volume. So we can say that an increase in pressure results in a decrease in volume. Through a series of experiments, Robert Boyle essentially proved that pressure is proportional to 1 over the volume. This proportionality symbol here might be a little bit new to you. Essentially what it says is that pressure is equal to 1 over V times some unknown quantity. Boyle was not able to figure out what that unknown quantity is. However, through his meticulous experiments, he was able to prove that pressure and volume are inversely proportional. This important relationship came to be known as Boyle's Law, which was formulated in 1662. The next important discovery about the ideal gas was made almost a century later by the French physicist Jacques Charles. Charles was using essentially the same setup as Boyle. Once again, we have a cylindrical container. It's equipped with a piston. We can measure temperature. We can add masses and we could add or subtract energy to the gas. The same relationships as before hold. Volume is related to height and pressure is related to mass. Charles was interested in investigating a slightly different question from the one that Boyle was investigating. Charles was assuming that mass was kept constant and he wanted to know what would happen if T is increased. Specifically, if T is increased, what happens to the height of the gas inside the cylinder? Well, here he discovered that as the temperature of the gas is increased, the height also increases. Here, Charles started with some fixed amount of mass and did not change that. He simply increased the uh, fuel supply to the Bunsen burner, adding energy to the gas, and he observed that the temperature was increasing. 
as the temperature increased, the height of the gas also increased, meaning that the piston was gradually pushed upwards. Now note that height and volume are related. So when we say that the height is increasing, we're essentially saying that the volume is increasing. So what Charles was discovering was that an increase in temperature results in an increase in volume. This important relationship between volume and temperature came to be known as Charles's law, which was formulated in 1780. Note again that essentially Charles's law states that volume is equal to temperature times some other unknown quantity here. Charles was not able to determine the unknown quantity, but he could see that there is a clear linear relationship between volume and temperature. As I mentioned earlier, the exploration of ideal gas properties continued for more than a hundred years. After Charles, the next important contribution was made by Joseph Guy Lussac. Guy Lussac was essentially using the same experimental setup as Boyle and Charles, but he was investigating a slightly different question. What he wanted to know was this suppose the height of the gas is kept constant. If mass is increased, what happens to the temperature? So here, what we're doing now is stacking additional weights on top of the piston. And by manipulating the Bunsen burner, we're keeping the height fixed and observing what happens to the temperature. When Guy Lussac did a series of experiments, he found that as the mass is increased, the temperature also increases. So here, what was happening is, as he put more masses on top of the piston, the piston began to gradually move down. In that case, he would turn up the Bunsen burner, adding more energy to the gas in an attempt to keep the height fixed. As he did that, he observed that the temperature was increasing. Once again, note that mass and pressure are related, so increasing the mass is equivalent to increasing the pressure. So what Guy Lussac was discovering was that an increase in pressure results in an increase in temperature. This came to be known as Guy Lussac's law, which was formulated in 1802. Once again, note that Guy Lussac is telling us that pressure is proportional to temperature. So pressure is equal to temperature times some other unknown quantities, which Guy Lussac was not able to determine. After more than a hundred years of experimentation, the following three laws were discovered to characterize the properties of an ideal gas. By this time, there was a feeling that these three laws must somehow be related. There was a feeling that there must be a single law that could unify these three equations. That task fell to the French physicist and engineer, Benoit Clapeyron, who finally formulated the ideal gas law. Clapeyron did not write the ideal gas law in this form exactly, but this is the form that is preferred today by most physicists. According to the ideal gas law, the pressure of the gas times the volume of the gas is equal to the number of particles in the gas times a constant times the temperature of the gas. The constant case of B is approximately equal to 1.381 times 10 to the minus 23 joules per Kelvin, and it is known as the Boltzmann constant. We'll learn much more about Mr. Boltzmann a little bit later in these lectures. Notice that the ideal gas law nicely encapsulates all three laws. We can derive Boyle's law from the ideal gas law by rearranging the equation and writing it in this form. The constant of proportionality that Boyle did not find turns out to be equal to nKB times temperature. Similarly, Charles found that volume is proportional to temperature, and again, we can see that from the ideal gas law, and the constant of proportionality is nKB over pressure. The Guy-Lussac law can also be derived from the ideal gas law with the constant of proportionality being the number of particles times the Boltzmann constant divided by volume. The ideal gas law is often expressed in a slightly different form. 
chemists and most other practical minded people often express the ideal gas law in this form, where the pressure times volume is equal to nRT. We use capital N to denote the number of atoms or particles in the gas, but we use lowercase n to denote the number of moles of gas. R is known as the gas constant, and it is approximately equal to 8.314 joules per mole per Kelvin. The two versions of the ideal gas law are, of course, equivalent, simply because the number of moles times the gas constant is equal to the number of particles times the Boltzmann constant. For a better understanding of this fact, we need a little chemistry which physicists sometimes don't like. To better understand the equivalence between the two forms of the ideal gas law, and also to better understand what a mole is, consider n atoms confined to a volume V with total mass m as shown here. Now there are several different ways that we could divide up this collection into smaller segments. One thing we could do is simply divide the volume into unit volumes. So we can, for example, divide the container into units of one cubic meter in volume and then talk about the amount of mass or the number of particles that exist inside each unit of volume. So looking at one unit of volume, we could talk about the mass that exists inside that volume or the number of particles that exists in that volume. The ratio of mass to volume gives us something that you should already be familiar with, that's the mass density of the gas. The ratio of the number of particles to volume gives us something that might be new to you. This ratio is known as the number density, is denoted by the Greek letter rho and a subscript number. It's basically telling us how many gas molecules exist in one cubic meter or one unit of volume. Now, it turns out we could divide this collection differently. We could look at individual atoms and talk about the mass or the volume of a single atom or particle of the gas. In that case, we have two other important ratios that we could talk about. The ratio of mass to the number of particles gives us what's known as atomic mass. This is basically the mass of a single atom. We could also talk about atomic volume, which is the volume occupied by a single atom. To find that volume, we take the total volume of the gas and divide it by the total number of particles. More generally, given these three parameters, n, v, and m, you can form six ratios. Of these six ratios, we'll be using only the first four. The last two are sometimes referred to as the specific number and specific volume of the gas. Although mathematically permissible, these two ratios don't find too many applications. Now physicists often like to talk about the number of particles in the gas. Although that's conceptually simple, in most realistic cases that's not very practical because even in a small volume of gas, the number of atoms or molecules is enormous. For that reason, chemists count the number of atoms or molecules in moles. One mole is equal to 6.022 times 10 to the 23. So when we say we have one mole of helium, for example, what we're saying is that we have 6.022 times 10 to the 23 helium atoms. When we say we have one mole of water, we're saying we have 6.022 times 10 to the 23 water molecules or H2O molecules. Now you might be thinking why chemists use this specific number, why not use something more round like just 10 to the 23. The reason is that there are exactly this many atoms in 12 grams of carbon-12. That very unique fact was discovered by the Italian chemist Amedio Avogadro. For that reason, this special number today is known as Avogadro's number, and we denote it as N sub A. But you can basically think of Avogadro's number, or one mole, just as another name for this special number, much in the same way that we use the word dozen to stand for the number 12. When I say I have 
a dozen eggs. Essentially, what I'm saying is that I have 12 eggs. Now, what all of this discussion about moles means is that there are three new ratios that you need to be familiar with. First of all, we're interested in the number of moles of gas that there are. To find the number of moles, you take the total number of particles in the gas and you divide it by the number of particles in a single mole. So you divide N by Avogadro's number to find the number of moles of gas that there are. Then there's the molar mass for the gas, and this is simply the mass per mole. So on the previous slide, we talked about the atomic mass, which was the mass per atom. Here, we're talking about the mass per one mole of the material of the gas. We can also talk about the molar volume, which is the total volume divided by the number of moles, and that's simply the volume that's occupied by one mole of the gas. The last chemistry fact that you need to know is that the gas constant is simply defined as Avogadro's number times the Boltzmann constant. So you can think of the gas constant essentially as Boltzmann's constant, but defined for one mole of an ideal gas. Using this last fact, we can show that the two versions of the ideal gas law are in fact the same law. Let's end this lecture with a practice problem. A spray can with a volume of 125 cubic centimeters contains ideal gas at a temperature of 22 degrees Celsius and a pressure of 202 kilopascals. How many moles and how many molecules of gas does the spray can contain? For this exercise, we will need the Boltzmann constant and the gas constant. It may not have been obvious, but when using the ideal gas law, the temperature that shows up must be in degrees Kelvin. In this problem, the temperature is given to us in degrees Celsius, so we need to convert the temperature to Kelvin before substituting the number into the ideal gas law. To find the number of moles, we use the ideal gas law in this form. Recall that N is the number of moles of gas. By rearranging this equation, we find that the number of moles is equal to pressure times volume divided by the gas constant divided by temperature. The pressure is given to us as 202 kilopascals. We can write that as 202 times 10 to the third pascals. The volume is given to us as 125 cubic centimeters. We must convert that to cubic meters. The gas constant is already given to us in SI units. And as I mentioned, the temperature needs to be converted to degrees Kelvin. When we substitute all those numbers in, we find that this container holds 0 0.0103 moles of ideal gas. To find the number of molecules, we can simply take this number and multiply it by Avogadro's number, or we can use the ideal gas law in its other form. Recall that capital N is the number of molecules Rearranging this equation, we find that the number of molecules is equal to PV divided by the Boltzmann constant divided by the temperature. Once again, plugging all the numbers after converting to SI units, we find that there are 6.199 times 10 to the 21 molecules in this container. Continuing the same practice problem, part B asks the following question. The can is tossed into an open fire. What is the pressure inside the can when its temperature reaches 195 degrees Celsius? We're going to assume that the volume of the can and the number of particles inside the can do not change. Now, this is generally a dangerous thing to do. If you have a can of hairspray or air freshener, for example, you're advised not to throw it into an open fire. The reason is that as the temperature rises, the can can explode. Let's find out why. For this problem, we'll again need the Boltzmann constant and the gas constant. We can calculate the pressure of the gas using the ideal gas law in either of its two forms. By rearranging the ideal gas law, we find that the pressure is equal to the number of moles of gas times the gas constant times the temperature in degrees Kelvin divided by the volume in cubic centimeters. We found the number of moles of gas in part A of the problem. 
plugging those numbers in, we find that the final pressure of the gas is approximately 320 kilopascals. That's approximately equal to three atmospheres, which is a relatively high pressure. This is exactly the reason why the can explodes. The aluminum casing of these cans is simply not designed to withstand such high pressures. Now, I solved this problem using the ideal gas law, but it turns out there is another slightly quicker way to answer this question, which you might want to learn. According to the ideal gas law, PV is equal to nRT. When we're changing the temperature, we'll want to talk about the initial pressure and the initial temperature. Similarly, we'll want to talk about the final pressure and the final temperature. Notice that I'm not putting subscripts on V and N because those are assumed to be constant. So the ideal gas law is true all the time. However, initially we have one temperature and one pressure. Finally, we have a different temperature and a different pressure. Now, since V, N, and R do not change, we can also say something like P initial divided by T initial is simply equal to NR divided by V. And we can also say P final divided by T final is also equal to NR over V. Notice that the right sides of these two equations are equal to each other, and therefore we can equate the left sides of these equations together. In other words, we can say that P initial divided by T initial is equal to P final divided by T final. In this particular problem, many of these quantities were given to us. In particular, we know what P initial is, we know what T initial is, and we also know what T final is. So we can use this equation to find the final pressure, even without knowing the number of moles or the number of molecules. A little more precisely, I can tell you that the final pressure is equal to T final divided by T initial times P initial. Plugging in those numbers, we obtain exactly the same answer as before, but a little more quickly. And that is the end of this lecture. Thank you for your attention.